take control of your emotions is the word that I have for all of you today. We again, we are on a spiritual battlefield. And as we have seen, we are seeing that today's generation is a generation that is losing the battle for its soul on this spiritual battlefield. So to not lose its soul, we are seeing that today's generation, it must find Christ. It must see the sign that God has given to us in his only begotten son. We, might, we must not only see that sign, we must follow that sign. We must follow the sign that is Christ. And when we follow him, we are seeing that we must not live immorally. We must add virtue to our faith. We must live in a Christ-like manner. We have also seen that when we are living in a Christ-like manner, we must also add knowledge to our faith. We must add knowledge to our faith so that we aren't overcome by the flattering words of the ignorant one. So that we aren't overcome by the flattering words of the ignorant fool. And so as we continue in this series of sermons this week, I want us to take another look at the background scripture that I've had serving as background scripture for all of these sermons in this series. I want us to take a look at the first chapter of second Peter, but instead of taking a look at the fifth verse this week, we are going to take a look at the sixth verse because Peter, he has a word for us. In that again, we are to continue to grow by our faith. And so there is second Peter, the first chapter and the sixth verse. We'll see that Peter, he wrote that to our knowledge, we must take the next step in adding self-control to our faith. Self-control. And let us again note there from that scripture, that in adding self-control to our faith, we must do so again with all diligence. We must be serious in adding self-control to our faith. Now, we define self-control as restraint exercised over one's own impulses, restraint over one's emotions, restraint over one's desires. One that acts on impulse is one that acts without thought. They act in a manner that is irrational. It doesn't make sense. One that acts with unrestrained desire is one that moves out of selfish ambition. That is like moving out of greed. That is like moving out of lust. You are doing it for yourself. One that does not restrain their emotions is one that is controlled by their emotions. And it is very dangerous for one to be controlled by their emotions. Our emotions, they are reactions towards something that can change our behavior for the good or for the bad. So, for example, we know that our emotions can, can include anger, can include sadness, can include fear, can include anxiety, envy, covetousness. Our emotions, they can also include happiness. They can include joy. They can include love as well. Now, some of those emotions, they are certainly good for us, right? For example, it is good for us to be happy. It is good for us to be filled with happiness and to therefore then move out of that happiness. But on the other hand, there is anger. And we wouldn't say that it is good for us to move out of anger, is it? Because we know that anger, we know that it can become very toxic. We know that anger, that it can become very harmful. It can harm us, and then it can harm those that are around us as well. So again, I would ask you today, do you think that it is in your best interest 
to be controlled by certain emotions, emotions like anger. So again, on this battlefield, it is very dangerous for us to act irrationally. It is very dangerous for us to act on impulse. If we let those harmful emotions, emotions like anger, if we let those emotions control us, again, we will likely end up harming ourselves, but not just ourselves, we'll end up harming our loved ones. We would end up harming our, neighbor, our neighbors, our friends, our acquaintances, and even the strangers as well. So again, I tell you today that I believe that it would be in your best interest to take control of your emotions. Do you agree with me today? Amen. So again, as we take a look at my key verse there today, Paul, he wrote to those who are of the church of Ephesus about not allowing anger to settle in their hearts. Again, the church of Ephesus, we should be very familiar with this church. I have preached about this church before several times. We have learned about this church in Sunday school lessons on several occasions as well. We remember that the church of Ephesus, that it was divided among Jewish believers and Gentile believers as well. The Jewish believers, they would look down on the Gentile believers because they saw themselves as special treasures in God's eyes. They was God's chosen people. And so the Jewish believers, they would look down on the Gentile believers and they would stir up some raw emotions in that church. In fact, in the revelation of Christ, in the second chapter of the revelation of Christ, we will remember that Jesus, he warned that there was a lack of love that was in the church of Ephesus. And he told them that they needed to return back to their first love. So there we will see that Paul, he said there in the 26th verse, he said there, do not let the sun go down on your wrath. You see, Paul, he understood that allowing certain emotions to control us, he understood that it allows for Satan to be able to enter in. And if Satan enters in, he's doing it for one purpose. He's doing it for one reason. He is looking to take control. What good can ever come from allowing the devil to have control? What good could ever come from allowing the devil to take the wheel? I don't think any good can come from it. If you let the devil take the wheel, he will wreck. He will corrupt your soul. He will destroy your soul. As James wrote, wrath cannot produce the righteousness of God. As Jesus said, a good tree does not bear bad fruit. As he said, a bad tree, it cannot bear any good fruit. What kind of tree are you? Once again, we cannot leave the door open for Satan to control us. Because if we leave that door open through our emotions, the devil, he will cause us to act irrationally and he will destroy us. But again, he will not only destroy us, but he will destroy others through us. So we must be very weary today of letting emotions like fear, anxiety, envy, covetousness, lust, greed, and sadness. We must be very weary of letting harmful emotions have control over us. Fear and anxiety can lead to one having a heart of doubt. Therefore, fear and anxiety, while potentially being a motivator for us at times, when it is unrestrained, fear and anxiety, it can paralyze our soul in doubt. And again, that will wreck us. That's what the devil wants. He wants your soul to be paralyzed. Envy, covetousness, lust, and greed. Those emotions, unrestrained, they take our eyes off of what God has for us. 
because we are too busy looking at what somebody else has. These emotions, when they are unrestrained, they can cause us to think and to move like Cain. Do you remember how it was that Cain moved? Cain, you should remember, he killed his own brother because he was envious of his brother. How many of us today are killing our neighbors because we are envious of them? And I want you to understand that ain't, I'm not talking about physically killing them. Cain, he acted so irrationally that he didn't believe that he should have been his brother's keeper. How many of us are our brother's keepers today? How many of us don't think that we need to be our brother's keepers today? In other words, how many of us aren't loving our neighbors today because we don't think we need to love them today? Unrestrained sadness can lead to a well of deep sorrow. It can lead to depression. It can lead to despair. For example, I think of Job. A man who was filled with much grief, a man who was filled with much sorrow. Job's grief and sorrow, it paralyzed him to where all he could do was sit and do nothing on most of his days. He sat, he grumbled, and he complained about God. How many of us today are sitting, we are grumbling, and we're complaining about what God has not done for us? Are you moving in faith when you're doing that? So when it comes to these toxic emotions, scripture, it often encourages us to put them away from us. Over in the third chapter of Colossians and the fifth verse, you'll see that Paul, he wrote that we should quote unquote, put to death evil passions desires and covetousness. In the second chapter of first Peter and the first verse, Peter, he encouraged believers to lay aside with all malice, the emotion of envy, envy, which can lead to the actions of deceit, envy, which can lead to the actions of hypocrisy, which can lead to the action of evil speaking. We are to put envy, Peter said, away from us again with all malice. And so somebody may begin to wonder, well, if we are to put away our emotions, somebody may wonder, well, does this mean that we should become emotionless zombies? Does God want us to be zombies? Does the Lord want us to be cold hearted machines in this world? I got an uh uh when I asked that. You see, we must remember that, that when God created mankind, he created mankind to be fruitful and to multiply. In other words, he created mankind to flourish. He created mankind to prosper. The Lord, our God, he desires for us to experience happiness. You see, that is why the Lord loves you. That is why God cares for you. That is why God, that is why he blesses you. Because again, he wants you to be happy in your soul. And the last I checked, as I said here a few minutes ago, happiness is an emotion. Now, those emotions of anger, covetousness, and envy, those emotions, they did not show up in man until after man fell in the garden. That is when we began to become envious and, and jealous of others. Such emotions, they have now become a part of our nature, haven't they? which makes it hard for us to put them to death. Many of us will say, I can't just get rid of anger. I just can't turn that off, pastor. This is why I love what Paul says here in our scripture for today. 
This is why I love Paul saying there, be angry. He said it there. Paul, he said there, be angry. But then he said, in the caveat to that, he said, but don't sin. He said, be angry and do not sin. This shows us that, that Paul, he had an understanding that we are going to have those times where we get angry. This shows us there that Paul, he understood that we are going to have those times where we are rightfully upset, where we're rightfully frustrated with somebody, when somebody has done us wrong, when somebody mistreated us. Paul, he understood that we are going to go around with a big smile on our face when they have talked bad about us, when they have done us wrongly. He understood very well that we are going to be upset in those moments. At the same time, this also shows us that we are going to have those times where we will be sad, where we will be depressed, or even envious, where we may even covet wanting what somebody else have. We see somebody happy driving their new car, and we've been driving our car for 15 years. You better believe we're going to have those moments where we look over and go, man, I want something like that. How many of us have done that today? However, what Paul makes very clear there is that we shouldn't let emotions like wrath, we shouldn't let those kind of emotions be in us at the end of the day. He said, don't, don't let the sun set on that emotion. So what Paul, he shares with us today is that we need to learn how to to manage these emotions. We need to learn how to take control of these emotions before they take control of us and we do something that we will end up regretting at the end of the day. How many of us are in agreement with that, that we need to learn how to take control of our emotions today? If you are in agreement with that, you just raise your hand up with me. I wanna make sure that, that I'm not alone on this. Because I have what they would say, I have a resting angry face at times to where I don't want to be bothered. And it works out for me at times because I don't want to be bothered. And a lot of people, they know how to leave me alone. But I also have times where I just speak, just speaking regularly. And people think that I'm mad at them, that I'm upset with them, that I'm talking down to them. And at the end of the day, I go, God, I have to learn how to do better than that. I'm just talking regularly, but I have to do better than that. We, as God's children, we have to learn how to do better than that. We have to learn how to control our emotions. We can't let somebody get the best of us. And again, we can't let our emotions get the best of us because that again opens the door for the devil to creep in. And when the devil creeps in, he's looking to take the reins. He's looking to take the wheel and drive you whichever way that he wants to go. And at the end of the day, he's looking to run you into a wall. He's looking to wreck. He's looking to trash your soul. And again, we do not want to be wrecked in our soul. So how do we take control of our emotions? How is it that we go about taking control of our emotions? The first step to controlling your emotions, it comes down to something that I spoke about in last week's sermon, when we was talking about adding knowledge to our faith. The first step to controlling your emotions, it comes down to your fellowship with God. Fellowship is the first step there. We must learn how to first be in fellowship with each other. And there is a reason why God put us in a world with people, with those that are around us. We don't live in a world by ourselves. John, he said over in 1 John, the first chapter and the seventh verse, if you want to turn there and look at it for yourself. He said it best when he said that if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus it cleanses us from all sin. Without fellowship, 
this place would be a lonely place. You would be all alone. And over in the fourth chapter of Ecclesiastes and the 10th verse, the scripture tells us that if one is alone and falls, he has no one to help him up. If, if we end up in a terrible place emotionally and we are all alone, there is nobody that can help get us out of that place. So the fourth chapter of Ecclesiastes in the 10th verse, it tells us, but with a friend, when one is down, that friend will help to lift up their friend. The value of true fellowship, I would say to you today, it is a wonderful blessing. But the problem that we see in today's generation is that true fellowship is lacking in today's generation. I said this either last week or the sermon before that. We don't talk with one another today. We talk at each other. We don't talk to uplift each other. We talk to put down one another today. See, it is good to be surrounded by people of virtue that can keep it real with you, to let you know you messed up, to let you know you ain't perfect. It is good to be surrounded by people who will keep it real with you, people who will not lie to you when you have done wrongly. At the same time, it is good to be in fellowship with with people of virtue that can share an uplifting word with you, a word that has come from the Lord that will do your soul some good. That is what we are lacking in today's generation. It is not enough of that going around in the world today, uplifting the soul with an encouraging word from the Lord. We, we, we use our knowledge of, of worldly riches today. We, up some, we upset somebody, we go and get them something to make them feel better, don't we? Husband upset the wife, husband go out and get some flowers and a box of chocolate. Ain't that what they try to show on the TV shows? <laughs> when it comes to fellowship, we must lean on one another. Scripture proves it time and time and time again. In true love, there is an uplifting of the soul. And when it comes to fellowship, we must also continue to lean on our fellowship with the Lord. Again, if we want to take control of our emotions, we have our friends who can help us to be able to manage our, our emotions so that we aren't lashing out but we also have God as well. We'll see there in the 20th through the 23rd verse there that to the church of Ephesus, Paul wrote that if you have learned Christ, that is, if you know him, if you understand him, Paul said that you will then be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Let us remember that in our fellowship with God, we have received the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit renews us. He renews us in our soul. He does it around the clock. We must remember that the Holy Spirit's purpose is to lead. His purpose is to guide us into all truth, as he is the spirit of truth. And so because of the Holy Spirit, we know that the spirit of truth, we know the spirit of error as well. And those things, as I said in last week's message, it gives us peace of mind. It gives us comfort in knowing such truth. Peace of mind, I want you to understand today, is, is the fact that your soul is at rest. Your soul, it is at ease. And so those harmful emotions, when, when they try to enter in, when you know the spirit of truth, we you know the spirit of error, when you know that God is on your side, you have no reason to be excited in anxiety. You have no reason to stress. You have no reason to worry. Jesus, he said to his disciples that we ought not worry about our life. 
Jesus, he said that we ought not worry about what we will eat. We ought not worry about what we will drink. We ought not worry about what we will wear. Over in the sixth chapter of Matthew's gospel in the 25th and in the 26th verse, Jesus, he said that we should not worry because God cares for, for the other things of the world, but we are more precious. We are more precious to God than the other things of the world, than like the flowers of the field that the Lord tends to. And so if we are more precious than those things of the world, then God will treat us even better than he does those things. But sadly, because today's generation chooses not to be close to God, it will never know, it will never understand just how much God loves them. God, I want you to understand today, God, he loves you. He loves you. Weeping, as we say, weeping. Hey, it may happen for a night, but again, the emotion of joy, it will come in the morning, not because of our doing, but because of the Lord. And so because today's generation does not know the Lord, it leaves itself open again to being overcome by fear, by doubt, by worry, by depression, and by anger. Again, today's generation is a generation that leaves itself open to being emotionally compromised by the devil. And when you leave yourself emotionally compromised to the devil, he will take you and he will run you into that wall. He will destroy your soul and therefore he will destroy those who are around you who you can influence, who you can inspire, as we saw in our Sunday school lesson today. We have the ability to inspire others by our faith in the Lord, by living in a Christ-like manner. But again, today's generation is refusing to do that. And we wonder why the world is the way that it is today. You don't have to look far. Again, we must take control of our emotions and the first place the first place we must turn to in being able to take control of our emotions is fellowship, fellowship with each other, fellowship with a person who is of virtue and fellowship with the Lord. Amen. Amen. Now from fellowship, the second step to taking control of your emotions, I will tell you today again, along the line of fellowship, comes down to you talking to the Lord. Talking to God, you must talk to God. Prayer. Now this is where, this is where today's generation, it'll turn off this sermon. It'll turn away from this sermon because I just brought up prayer. Today's generation is a generation that doesn't believe in the power of prayer. It doesn't believe in the power of prayer, let alone will today's generation even pray to God, but we must, we must pray to the Lord today. Those that may attempt to pray to the Lord, they often doubt their prayer works because they don't think that God is listening to them. But again, I tell you today that prayer requires faith. If you're praying about what it is that you're going through, if you're praying about what it is that you're feeling today, you must be confident in your prayer to the Lord. Let's understand that those who pray while doubting, they shouldn't ever expect to receive anything from God. That's what James said. Of course, those that never pray, they should never expect to receive anything from the Lord. That just makes sense. You aren't asking God for, for anything. So why should you expect to receive anything from him? See, prayer, it is often advised because that's how often we forget to pray to the Lord. You see, when you don't talk to God, it's like you're turning him, turning him down. You're turning down his help, which is something that we should never, ever do because we go through it in life. Life is filled with many hardships. Life is filled with many aches. It's filled with many pains in it. 
So I certainly believe that, that we need to talk to God today because we catch it, don't we? I love what my brother, he said something to me the other day that I want to, to share with all of you. He said that he was making a, a change in his prayer life. And the change that he said that he was making in his prayer life was that he was going to start being a bit more intentional in his prayers. Intent. Intentional in his prayers. You see, a lot of times we aren't direct with God in our prayers. We aren't direct with the Lord in our supplication when scripture, it teaches us, it tells us time and time again that we should be intentional in our prayers, that we should be direct with God in our prayers. Mm -hmm. To the Philippians, Paul, he wrote, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, let your request be made known to God. In the fourth chapter of Hebrews and the 16th verse, the writer encouraged believers to go boldly before the throne of grace. The writer didn't say be timid when you go before the throne of grace. The writer didn't say be hesitant in going to the throne of grace. The writer said go boldly before the throne of grace. Boldly, intent, when you go before the throne of grace. James, he said that when you ask in faith, when you ask in confidence, he said that God will liberally supply your needs without hesitation, without reproach. How many of us are going boldly before the throne of grace today? Our Savior, he said that whatever we ask in his name, he said that we must know that God will give, that God will do. Do you believe that he will do it today? I ask you today, do you believe that God can help you in taking control of your emotions? If you do, man, I say to you today that you need to go to him in prayer. You need to go to him in prayer and you need to let him know exactly what it is that you're going through. But not just that, when you are feeling hurt, when you are feeling down, you need to know, you need to let God know exactly how you are feeling. That is something that we do not do enough of today. We don't let the Lord know how we are feeling on the inside. We always try to walk around with a brave smile on our face. Now, some may wonder, why do I need to, to let God know how I'm feeling? Shouldn't he already know how it is that I am feeling? That is what many ask when it comes to prayer. Why do I need to pray to God? He should already know what I'm going through. I have an answer to that. I have a response to that today. Well, God certainly knows what it is that we are going through. While the Lord certainly knows how we are feeling, I tell you today that when you talk to God, when you pray to God, it is therapeutic. There has never been a time when I prayed to the Lord that I came away from that prayer not feeling good, not feeling better about my situation, not feeling better about my feelings. There has never been a time where I prayed and I left my prayer feeling worse than I did entering into my prayer. I tell you today that prayer, it can alleviate some things from you today. Prayer can alleviate those harmful feelings that you feel pressing down. You know when you feel those feelings, they feel like they're just pressing down, they're just weighing down on your heart. It almost feels like your, your heart is heavy. Where your heart is, it feels like your heart is beating too fast, that it, that it has gotten off beat. I tell you today, when you go to God in prayer, it can alleviate those issues that you're having the Lord, he replaced those feelings that you have. He replaced them with hope. He replaced them with love. He replaced them with peace. Again, if you don't want your harmful emotions taking control over you, let God enter into the picture by talking to him. And he will do away with those harmful emotions. Ultimately, being able to take control of your emotions, it boils down to 
whether or not you truly trust the Lord. Do you trust God today? As the proverb says, we must trust in the Lord with all our heart and we must not lean on our own understanding. What good is that going to do for us? If you don't trust God today with your emotions, I tell you today that you must learn how to trust him. You must learn to trust him. You must learn how to believe in him. You must learn how to have faith in him. You must learn how to have patience in the Lord today. Do you have patience with God today? Do you really have patience with God today? We got some uh huhs. The third step to controlling your emotions is that patience. Controlling your emotions requires patience. But sadly, today's generation is an impatient generation. Today's generation is a generation that is always in a rush. We are a generation that moves from one thing to the next, and we do it frantically. We do it without thought. We do it on impulse. We do it irrationally. And, and I can't figure out for the life of me where today's generation is in a rush to. Where is it trying to get to? Why is today's generation in such a hurry? All I've ever seen is that impatience, it leads many to be swift to the feeling of doom, to being down and in despair when their reward isn't in an instant. You know, we always want things just like that. That is why many get into fellowship with God. They believe that life is going to be sunshine and rainbows. They believe that they're blessing. When they pray to God, they believe that it's going to pop into existence. In patience, it leads many to be swift to envy. It leads many to be swift to covenants. Because, again, they look, they see what somebody else already has. And again, if they are one who is of faith, they will say, well, God, why don't I have that? That's what I pray for. Why you give it to them? Why haven't I got it? You see, when things don't go the way of the impatient soul, the impatient soul is quick to get angry. The impatient soul is quick to get frustrated. The impatient soul is quick to get upset. They'll let that sun set on their anger. Their anger, it'll fester, it'll boil up into wrath. They'll take their wrath out on others, and then they'll turn their wrath onto God, and then they'll blame God for everything that they're going through. How many of us have did that? So I would tell you all today that impatience is a detriment. It is a driver to why so many people today struggle in controlling their emotions. It is why so many people today are lashing out. It is why so many people today are in the pit of despair. It is even today why so many people end up in depression, end up having great sorrow. You see, on this spiritual battlefield, you must learn how to settle down. You must learn how to settle down in your emotions. You must learn how to trust in the way that God is moving for you. How many of us trust how God is moving for us today? I do my best to trust in how God is, is moving for me. Now, am I perfect in that? No, absolutely not. But again, I tell you today that we must learn how to trust in the Lord. We must come to know that all things work together, good and bad. They all work together for good because we have loved the Lord. Do you love the Lord today? Amen. As the prophet Isaiah said, those who wait on the Lord, those who trust in him will have their strength renewed 
We will run on this journey. We will not grow weary. We will not faint on this journey because God has uplifted us. Again, we will not grow weary in sorrow. We will not faint because of our anger. We will not end up in the pit of despair because God, he lifts us up, as Uncle would say, out of the muck and the miry clay. And he places us on solid ground so that we can continue to move on this journey. You see, uh, I don't know if you believe it today or not, but I do believe that it is possible for you to take control of your emotions and for your emotions not to take control of you. Do you believe that today? So to display such control, we have to train our mind today. We have to train our heart today to not always be in such a rush. We cannot be in a panic today based on how things are going for us or, or for somebody, our loved ones as well. We have to train ourselves to slow down. We have to slow ourselves down when it comes to our initial response, our initial reactions to what it is that we may be going through or what somebody else may be going through today. Again, we must remember that God, he is the one who is at the wheel. We must remember today that it is God that is in control, not anybody else, not somebody else. It is God, our sovereign Lord, who is in control today. So as, as Paul did, I will do today. I will urge all of you today, I will urge this generation, as he did there in the 30th verse, to not grieve the Holy Spirit by being so impatient and feeding it with harmful and toxic emotions. Again, when we learn such control of ourselves, when we learn such control over our emotions, I tell you today that we can become a much more difficult opponent, a much more difficult foe for Satan to handle on that spiritual battlefield. Rather than being easily overcome on the battlefield, we will move with great confidence on the battlefield. We won't have any fear. We won't have any worries. We won't have any anxieties. We won't have any stress. The door to Satan being able to enter in and to control us, it will close smack in his face. I don't know about you, but I want to slam the door on Satan today. How many of us want to slam the door on Satan today? To the Corinthians, Paul, he wrote that we have weapons to use on this battlefield. And Paul, he said that our weapons, he said that they aren't carnal. Paul, he said that our weapons, that they are mighty in the Lord, our God. Paul said that our weapons, that they are spiritual, that they are able to pull down strongholds. Do you believe that today? They can even bring down every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. You see, there is power in self-control. There is power today in controlling the way that you think. When you can control the way that you think, you can have a better handle on your emotions. You see, there's power in self-control because when you have that self-control, that knowledge of the spirit of truth, the spirit of error, the knowledge of God loving you, the knowledge of knowing that God will keep you, that he will uplift you, you won't be rattled in your faith. The devil won't be able to rattle you. He won't be able to stir you up. Through patience, prayer, and through your fellowship with God, at the end of the day, you'll be able to put away those emotions. Yeah, they may be there for a moment, but that's just it. They are there for that moment. They don't have control over you. That is the key. Through patience, prayer, and your fellowship with God, you will be swift to be able to slow down. You'll be swift to come to a stop, and you will be able to find clarity where those harmful emotions, where they will cloud your thought. 
with God on your side, you will have clarity. And I tell you today, clarity is everything. Clarity is the key. Clarity is the key to having success on this spiritual battlefield. Will you turn it all over to Jesus? Will you let him work it out? What it is that you're going through and what it is that you're feeling, I hope that you will today. Amen. 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 Thanks for watching this week's sermon. I hope that you enjoyed this week's message and I hope that you'll share it with someone somewhere. If you haven't done so already, make sure that you like this video, follow the channel as well as hit the alert bell so that you don't miss any notifications so that you don't miss any of the wonderful videos that we share here on the Newfound Faith YouTube channel.